Welcome to another edition of Nurses Talk, where you are going to get real perspectives from real nurses on a variety of healthcare topics that are important for all of us. Speaking of real nurses, with me, as always, is Nurse Carrie, Nurse Kevin. Welcome. Thank you. Hello. hello. I'm Nurse Lisa Tomka, and welcome to Nurses Talk. You know, I've said this before on other shows. I spend a lot of time in airports, and it's a perfect opportunity to people watch. Do you ever do that? Oh, you go to the mall, I go to the airport. People watch. Or when I'm not reading, I'm like reading a schmaltzy novel or I'm eating something that I probably shouldn't because in airports, not the healthiest food. It's hard to find. Right. Something you know. gives you permission to eat like that. In I know, I yeah, know. It's sort of the, it's, yeah, you allow it because you're traveling. So, I, exactly. So I can have it. So I'm starting to think, uh, last time I was in the airport, I'm looking around and starting to think of the statistic for obesity, at least in adults in America. Isn't it like something, I'm asking, isn't it something like over 30% yeah, of adults I are? 30. I don't commit that to memory, but that sounds about right. It's, and it's getting worse, right? right? Perhaps we could think of it that before adults became overweight, they started as overweight children. So to help us understand more about this and to share her expertise on bariatric surgery in children and also that she's also an expert in obesity in children is Michelle Pulfis RN. Welcome, Michelle. Welcome to Nurses Talk. Hi, thank Welcome. you very much. <laughs> so a hot question I have is what's the difference between the chunky, cute kid and the overweight child? Like, when does that boundary cross the line? That's a great question. I Let me just, even before we okay. begin, following up on that, the cute, bouncy baby that's chubby, because that's supposed to be a mark of health, even at that age, mm -hmm. then it leads into sort of moving along in time. Or does it? Or, or does, does it? it? Right, yeah. or does it? Right. I think all of those actually play a large role in what we are talking about as an epidemic nowadays. It surely is. Um, yeah. We are looking at children that are overweight, and really the time we can start calling someone weight, overweight or obese, is two years old. Um, really? That's when we start two? using a body mass index. Really? Yeah. A BMI number is a medical number that it's very objective. It takes their weight in kilograms divided by meters square, and you can place it on a graph. And depending on where right. the child falls on a graph, places them in a category, underweight, normal weight, overweight, or obese. Okay. So it's a very objective measure to use. And off, I don't think anyone wants to hear their child called obese, right. but it is something that as a healthcare provider, I think it's our job to mm -hmm. share with them that there's concern because we're finding that overweight children, young especially, are turning into overweight adults. So that's a fair statement, is if yeah. I start, you know, I didn't just get this way. No. But for a baseline for a two-year-old or a three-year-old, just to give us a concept, like what is the average weight? When, when would somebody be concerned in pounds? That a lot depends on your height. On the height? Yeah, that BMI number really takes that into account. And then you'll also hear the stories as older, older kids are, they're very muscular. Right. Yeah, and I think yeah, that we just have big to bone. Or big exactly. bone. That's what I always was. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was always big boned as a girl. Yeah. And we have cultures where, we'll like that later. Kevin yeah. said, uh, culture and you know, Hispanic culture is very much a proponent of having a large baby as a healthy baby. Um, or if you're underweight, you're malnourished or maybe poor. And so that is a sign of identity. So we really want to just share with them and educate them early on that what is going into their mouth. And as far as a specific weight, I can't say a certain number of pounds that is a concern. But when you start tracking this on a graph, you can show them in objective measures to say, there's a little concern here, and let's catch it before it goes too far. It must so be so hard to talk to the parents. I can't even imagine. Well, is there, I mean, is there a um, pushback? Uh, that's, no, is you're like wrong. a denial? Yeah, it, that denial can't be. is not just a river in Egypt. I mean, yeah. right? Yeah, or... Well, I'll be honest, when you're looking, and you work in pediatrics, one of the things that you're looking at is when the parents walk in, you're looking at them first. Really? Oh, because yeah. they are a role model sure. and their genetics are going to be given to that child. So if you have an overweight adult, most likely there's a higher chance that you're going to have an overweight child. If both parents are overweight, it raises that child's chance. But then doesn't, but is, won't the pushback be, well, genet, you mentioned, you brought up genetics. Uh, there's nothing we can do about it. nothing I can do about it. I, this is, I have a slow metabolism. Yeah, it's my metabolism. That was my, I ex, that was I my excuse. I use that one too. I use that one too. That or the thyroid. Yeah, which both I use that one too. <laughs> 
Um, it, no, I think in, uh, at that point you have to say, we do know that genetics put you at a higher risk and it really, really stinks. I'm really sorry to say that your genetics do make you at a higher risk, but your environment is what's gonna cause that obesity to occur. So let's focus on what we can control and that's your environment and let's look at where we can make changes. And I guarantee you in any situation, there's gonna be areas that you can make changes. So do you find that the families or the child, especially as they get older, you know, seven and up, do they lie about what their dietary intake is? Or do you find that they're pretty truthful by the time they come to you, they really want some help? The age is very much um, plays an important role in that. And the fact that they've possibly been teased a lot about their weight, there's been a lot of focus on their weight. And if they're coming to a specialty practice for their weight, mm -hmm. obviously that has, it's not happened overnight. Um, so we try to put a very, I think it takes a very special provider and not just the registered nurse or nurse practitioner or a doctor, but also you need to have your dietary component, mm -hmm. a registered dietitian, an exercise specialty, and a psychologist. In a perfect setting, those are people you'd want to be having interact with that sort child. Sort of like we'd call it wraparound services. So yeah. it's, you're not just tackling just the eating, you're talking about the, it's a team. Now you, you, you've got your doctorate. So you've been, has this been your area of research for a long time? Um, well, I only have my PhD from last year, so it is my area of research and focus, but this has been my passion forever. Um, I was an obese child myself, and then you grow up, and then you work in primary care, and you see these children coming in, and they are larger. And then as you, um, I moved into my nurse practitioner practice, um, past primary care, and I specialized in obesity and got my PhD so I could also research Congratulations, it. that's really cool. So, yeah. So what type of success do you see? I mean, do you see actually and track long-term you know, it's easy for any of us to lose any amount of weight. It's keeping it off. I wouldn't say it's easy for anyone. Who is she talking to? It's easier to lose it, it than Can to keep it off. Can I have another Snickers bar? I mean, really. <laughs> Uh, we do see success, but there's a lot of factors that play into that, and it's very frustrating because people always want to say, what are your success rates? Mm -hmm. People can look at success and different measures. Right. Um, you can say how much weight was lost. We could also say, well, how many not healthy habits were they doing before, and how did we improve those healthy habits? Right. So you can look at that in a spectrum. Um, the other thing with the success is if we can just get them on the right track, the earlier we start, the earlier right. we can get these habits ingrained and get back to a healthier um, start. Do you, do you find, too, it, that people react to this thinking, oh, I've got to, I've got to lose this enormous, or my child, mm -hmm. since we're talking about children, have to lose this enormous amount of weight, when in reality, even just small weight loss can affect good, a, a good change over, over, the, over the next 10 years. I mean, it doesn't have to be enormous amounts of weight. We know when they come in uh, where we'd like them to be eventually, but we would never say, we're going to have to lose 60 pounds in order to get you healthy. You're always going to want to make small, attainable goals, and that's what's going to make this person well, gain confidence. So frustrating. That's right. Yeah. You and can never win. It well, can everybody happen. There. People want a magic bullet, though. They want it to, they want it to come off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't want it. That's a lo the long term is difficult. Right. So do you do like a lot sustain. of surgical interventions to help the children lose weight? I would not say a lot, but I think it's an option. And I think in this day and age, we have to look at the fact that we do have an increasing epidemic of childhood obesity. And if we don't look at what options we have, we really, we're not at the point where we can say, no, let's not look at that as an option. So is that like the lap band, and yeah, the bypass? Yeah, but before, before we go to that, though, I want to ask, uh, from an education standpoint, those are the least invasive measures, right? Before we go to something that's really invasive and something radical for a child to lose weight, what kind of educational uh, programs do we typically conduct for our kids? Okay, I think as far as in the perfect world, prevention, breastfeeding starting early on. So I think before the child's even born, talking to the parent about breastfeeding. What's, now what's the connection there? The fact that they're going to be able to eat till they're um, full and they're not going to be continuously fed and then you also have more immuni immunity well, and it's that, just better for the child. That I knew about, but, is there a direct but you found a direct correlation between having been breastfed and being more normal weight? Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah, and then formula fed, because oftentimes with formula feeding, it's the same story that you have a, a bottle, they have to finish the bottle. I'm going to continue feeding them. Okay. And then you lose your social cues of being full, and then it's a continuous feeding. I need to get this many ounces in versus at a breast. You're not considering how much or what they've had, and you just know when they're done, they're done. So that's a very healthy a way to start. Point. It is a great point. Um, wow. And then early on, trying to educate about nutrition. As a parent, not many parents understand how to read a food label because they're very confusing. So right. trying to talk to them about how when you walk down a cereal aisle, the media is working against you, and they are putting the bad high sugar items right at that Frosty child's flakes, level. Right there when they're sitting in the car. And cart, your child is going to be <laughs> yeah tugging yep. at you. And so you can educate them at that preschool and then the school age level. And then as a child's getting older, you educate them also. We went by very simple rules. Three, two, one, zero. It's just very easy to remember. What's that? Three meals a day. It's very 
important because, first of all, we have a large amount of kids that come in that are skipping breakfast or skipping one of their they're meals hungry. a day. And they don't think they're hungry or they're right. tired because they're staying up till one in the morning and they want to get to um, wake up as late yep. as possible. Lifestyle. So they are skipping breakfast and then they're going to school and then they're hungry and then they're gorging whatever they can. Mm-hmm. And most likely it's a processed food item right. or whatnot. Something out of, a, out of a vending machine or whatever. So three meals a day, no skipping meals. Then the other thing is two hours or less of screen time. And as adults, this is a very tricky one because of time? screen like cancel computer, Christmas man TV. computers or television computer TV video games oh, yeah, yeah and, here we go um, right. also two and phone hours time total. in a day and I'm in a school day you think well that can't be that difficult but in the summertime we have kids coming in and saying well 12 hours a day 15 video, when you start adding yeah. that up it does add up um, and adults too we're not really good role models mm-hmm. One hour of moderate to visit vigorous physical activity every day, and that's intentional activity that can't be saying, well, I walked up and down the stairs to get to my class during the day. Zero sweetened beverages, huge. Our world is, the sweetened beverage industry is just making a large amount of money. It's bombarding And it starts us. off with yep. juice in the youngsters, and then we go on to our chocolate milk and strawberry but milk. You- but not, I hate to interrupt you, yeah, but that juice fine. thing is uh, is interesting because everybody we've all been conditioned. The juice is good. Ju- yeah. The juicy box. Oh, I don't I don't have kids, but juicy box. But the, just a glass, a nice tall glass of orange juice every morning. Yeah. Isn't that that like the healthy, healthiest way for me to start my day? I'd much rather have you eat that orange. Yeah. And that orange is going to be better fiber. It's going to fill you up. What about well, right? No, that's very. Right. <laughs> I know exactly. So the before though, we we ha- we ha- sent our nurse on the street. Speaking of education, okay. we sent our nurse on the street, Joanne Dombrowskis, out to a daycare center to interview kids about what they think good nutrition is, and you would be surprised at what they said. Let's check it out. Hey guys, how you doing today? Good, good. What do you, what's your name? Josh. Josh. Josh and jo- Josh and Josh, are you guys like best friends? So, can you guys tell me a little bit about um, maybe some healthy foods that you might eat? Um, apples, <laughs> bananas, strawberries, broccoli. Do Do you know what it means to um to be healthy and and have good nutrition? To be strong. So you think it's important to to exercise and and eat right? Definitely. For everybody or just for kids? Everybody. For everybody, right. Hi there, what's your name? AJ. AJ, can I have you just come over here a little bit closer to me, is that okay? Sure. Do you know what healthy foods are? Mm-hmm. What are a few? I eat cheese-covered broccoli. Do you, do you know what good nutrition means? Mm-hmm. You don't know? Do you have maybe an idea? Mm-hmm. Hi, girls. What's Hi. your name? Kylie. Kylie, how old are you? Six. What's your name? Brianna. Brianna, and how old are you? Ten. Ten? Ashley, and I'm 12 years old. I've been coming here since I was six months old. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so what do you do during the day? Sometimes we do cooking, we play kickball a lot. Can yeah. you tell me a little bit more about cooking? We make brownies and um, we make cake balls once. How about watching television? Do you girls like to watch TV? Sometimes. Sometimes. How about you? SpongeBob. SpongeBob SquarePants. Love that show. What would be your description of a healthy person? What would they look like? They could be like skinny, kind of. And mm-hmm. like Hi, girls. How you doing today? Good. Good. Can you tell me your names? Haley. Haley. Savannah. Sammy. What's your um, f- absolute favorite thing that you just can't wait, like you dream about having? Bananas and ice cream. At school, do you talk about um, what's healthy and what's not healthy? We have a food pyramid at our school. Okay. Healthy foods, junk foods, whole wheat, breads, and dairy. What's your name? Ian. Can you tell me what um, it means to be healthy? Yeah, like not having any cavities. Okay. Do you play on the computer or video games? Sometimes. Does your mom and dad, you know, kind of restrict that for you? They want you outside playing? My dad, he he just doesn't care. (laughs) Okay. Well, thank you very much for talking to me today. Weren't those kids awesome? They were. They're absolutely adorable. Michelle, what did you think about when we interviewed those kids? It was so fun to see them, and they were having a great time, and they were all giving their honest answers, and quite honestly, I think the awareness that is now here, you can see that it's actually making an impact on a subset of families, but there's still a large amount out there that are not eating as quite as good as they are, and those are probably the patients that I'm seeing more often. Do you think there's a link between the socioeconomic 
yeah. and obesity? Yes, um, we do know that everyone is at risk and your genetics do play a portion of that, but also African-American, Latinos, and lower socioeconomic status mm -hmm. do play larger roles and have a higher risk. Why is that? Part of it is their genetics and the um, predence the disposition to that, the lower socioeconomic group, some things are out of their control. Perfect example, very quick story. Uh, I met this family and the young 13 year old boy, he had said, we made a deal. His goal was gonna be, he was gonna go to bed at a normal time earlier than midnight, and that was oh. our deal. <laughs> so that was it, you know, cause you have to start small. And he came back and I said, you know, how did it go? And I was so excited because he was so re ready to make a change. He said, I, I didn't do it. And I said, why not? You said you were gonna work on that. And he was like, well, at my grandma's house, there's a lot of gunshots and I couldn't fall asleep. Oh, of course. Wow. And that's obviously a neighborhood that maybe it, maybe it is lower socioeconomic. And so you have to look at safety. Can they be outside to play on exactly. a regular basis yeah, and not absolutely. have the parents Who worried about them? Right, well, right, and right. junk food is cheap. Exactly. And it's easy and it's accessible. Yeah, those are often called food right. deserts and they don't have a lot of fresh food available to them or they are buying whatever is available at the convenience store, mm -hmm. the gas station or fast food. So that just means that they're, they're, they they're don't fresh. have access yeah. to what they need except yeah. at the little corner store where they can go get the chips and the, yep, the and soda. Yeah, the junk and the, food. Right, and the junk yeah, food. Not health. So let's move into talking about uh, another reason why we have you here today and talking about um, bariatric surgery for children. Who would have thought? Yeah. I know when I met you, we're like, that doesn't happen. We can't possibly have that as an intervention. Can you help us understand something about that? Like we were saying before, you have to look at all options. And medication, there's just not a lot out there that is approved for children to be safe to give to them. So you're really down to one option for medication, and it's really not a very good option. So we take that and put what that in the myth. Ally, the over-the-counter oh. Orlistat. Oh, boy. And you can, it yeah, it's a fat um, lipase inhibitor. And so it's a commercial where you can have an accident. Yeah, that would be bad. <laughs> right. um, and then you look at behavior change, which should always be your cornerstone of anything you're doing. But you have to look at your other option, and that is surgery. And there's a small, small subset of children or adolescents that are eligible to have bariatric surgery as an option nowadays. So who, who, what's the profile of a child who fits yeah, that? Yeah, criteria. Over, how overweight are they? You know, what, what? We go back to the BMI numbers, and we have to look at their BMI, over 35 or 40, depending on what medical comorbidities. That's not that high. It's not, but it's a lot of it falls back on what comorbidities or additional medical illnesses related to the obesity are occurring. So explain, we'll stop, because we're using comorbidities. That's a, that's a term that nurses use and clinicians use. Explain to our audience what that means first. Additional medical diagnoses that are going to occur because of the obesity. So I would call them a comorbidity to the obesity. And so. Okay. so like a, um, an add-on yeah. because you have asthma, this. You, know, yeah. you had asthma as well or which obesity can play a role in that Absolutely. also. Yep, yep. Um, type 2 diabetes is huge. Hypertension, uh, hyperlipidemia, or cholesterol problems. In children. Fatty liver disease is oh. happening very commonly. Um, and then sleep apnea. Those are probably the, the bigger ones that you hear about. So if you're dealing with those, we know that if you would go through bariatric surgery, there's a high chance that you can actually take away some of those comorbidities right. or diagnoses. Help eliminate some of those mm -hmm. things. Yeah. Okay. And so, um, so one thing is we have to look at what their BMI is and if they meet that criteria. The second part that's very crucial is they have to be done growing in height. So we have to do a, a bone age or so a bone these scan. Are not for little, these are not no, for small children. We're not children. talking about six-year-olds. We're talking about oh, no. um, teenagers. Yeah, and even, even though we recommend and say that there's going to be this large group of people that might fit the criteria, it's really such a small subset of them that are actually ever even going to be talked to about this. So it's usually age 16 and over? It depends. Girls go faster than boys and are usually done. The earliest, you, typically you're going to see a girl done growing 13 years old. That doesn't mean that every 13-year-old is going to be right, well, right, right. whisked off to have bariatric surgery. But those are girls, boys closer to 15. Okay. Um, and then around 16, and we've you know, looked at when we've done it, 16 years old seems to be a time. And mm -hmm. we've had a very small number. It's not something that you rush to. And it was very unique situations um, so that they have to fully understand what they're getting into because right. this is a life-changing. I was going to ask you, what are their emotional things about this and the psychological Psychology prep plays that has a to go huge on? Role. So what is that like? It's, it's incredible because these kids are often being teased, their self-concept oh, or identity, yeah. their quality of life. And then you have to look at, though, if you think about a typical teenager, they can't see past tomorrow. Oh, images. And they're invincible. And image is so important. Right, right, right. Fitting in. So that part makes it very attractive because in their mind, they think of a quick fix. They see, see the biggest loser. They're going to lose gonna all this weight. Right. And unfortunately, we have to be very careful and say this is not a quick fix. Mm -hmm. Even people that have um, bariatric surgery after being morbidly obese, they might only go down to obese, not morbidly obese anymore. Right. There's often a plateau. So it's not a guarantee that you're going to become that svelte um, girl magazine, that you see. The well, one you on the magazine covers the pressure. I mean, right. the societal pressure. Do you want to ask about 
Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, you know, people have the concept that bariatric surgery is going to change everything, but mm -hmm. you can get around it. So if you're a child who sneaks milkshakes and mm -hmm. ice cream and all those things and they don't have what's called dumping syndrome, right? <laughs> That happens, but it doesn't happen to every child. Mm -hmm. Some will never even lose weight. Exactly. And it's a lot of time and effort. So right. a reputable center would not even consider someone that is not having really realistic expectations of what's going to happen and if their family support so is also huge. So a uh, word of advice to a parents of a child who are who is overweight or obese is if the first thing out of the clinician's mouth is I think we should consider bariatric surgery you should be running out the door. I, I do think so. I think that is a large red flag that should be going up and that should not be our norm. This is a it, it is a potential option for a small subset of, mm -hmm. of children. And I mean adolescents when I say children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's just you know and we're role model. The adults are role models. We talked about that earlier. So now you're driving down any highway in any city and the billboards are out there about bariatric surgery for adults. There's, we're certainly not advertising it for children. How do we know then that for children this doesn't become the quick fix? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that the billboards are advertising a quick fix. I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. But I could hear the pressure in our country for especially girls mm -hmm. to be thin. I mean, getting breast implants at well, 16 for crying out loud. Yeah, they're earlier, getting rhinoplasty earlier. for graduation gifts. So when will, you know, when do we, cro how do we know how we're not going to cross the line? Or will we, and you said reputable, that well, would I be think, honest, you know. I think she hit it on the head is to make sure that you're really having a comprehensive team review that child, which is mm -hmm. social worker and dietitian and all that. So if you're in the... And there's also got to be legality. I was going to say that I know you've talked to ethics in yeah, the past. Right. This is a huge ethical oh, yeah. issue. Really? Yeah, absolutely. From a hospital standpoint, you should be bringing in. But, you know, earlier on, and um, you mentioned, uh, we talked about sweet drinks that, mm -hmm. you know, that are so already readily available juicy in box. schools. Yeah, juicy box. So that really leads to a policy. I mean, a po those are sort of policy questions, aren't they? I mean, can, are we going to legislate? I mean, you know, where I live, the mayor tried to put a tax on uh, soda. Mm -hmm. And... For two reasons. One was, you know, the city would like the revenue because of the current economic climate. Mm -hmm. But the other piece was, hopefully, because there's, a, there's an obesity epidemic, you know, among children where I am. The, the hue and cry, you can't tell us what to do, you can't legislate what I eat, what I drink. Absolutely. And yet, then, there's the, then, the, then, the, then the, the fallout from that later is, who's going to pay for the fact that you now have comorbidities related right. to that? Oh, then the next thing you know, everybody's saying, well, I'm not paying for that in my insurance. Why is my insurance going up? Oh. I mean, it's this crazy... It's like they're not connecting. They're not well, connecting right. That's the two. Exactly. exactly. I, I really, the point I would love to make with obesity is that it's multifactorial. We did not get to this point overnight, and it and didn't happen because of one reason. There's multi-reasons. And so to really make a change, we have to look at it from all of those different factors. And government plays a role. Healthcare plays a role. Education, mm -hmm. schools mm -hmm. play a role. But families also play a role. Oh, yeah. So instead of pointing fingers, if everyone just said, what could I do as an individual and in my profession to make a change? And I guarantee there's always something you could do. You know, childhood obesity has a really, it really is highly visible now. The first lady is very much behind. Behind this, Michelle Obama. Do you think that's making any changes? I, you know, I think there's been a lot of things. Before her, President Clinton did the Alliance for Healthier Generation. Um, there's obviously many different initiatives. And I think anytime you open up the newspaper, you hear on the news, we know we have an obesity crisis. We know that. Next generation is thought to be the first generation that's not going to I've read that. Um, live longer than yeah. their parents. Oh my God. So we have Very to deal sad. with this. And it's really, it really is an epidemic. It's a disaster. Exactly. It if we're is. saying I mean, it's not our is. problem, it's, it, it is our is problem bad. because it affects health care costs. So yeah. everyone is infected one way or the other. Well, Michelle, we could really, this is another one. We could talk about this forever. Is there anything, what should our audience take away from this? What is like, if they could take away one thing from this, what would it be? I always say empower yourself as a parent or as a child yourself. And when you go to your well checkups, ask, what does my BMI say about me? What does our family genetics put me at risk for? What can I do to be making a difference? Are we doing everything we can? And start the conversation if it's not already been started, which I think providers are really good at, but sometimes it's not a bad idea to be the one to initiate that. Mm -hmm. Good Great. advice. Good advice. Yeah. Dr. Michelle Pulfus, RN, thanks for joining us on Nurses Talk. Thank you very much. Nice meeting you all. Fabulous. The discipline of nursing or the profession of nursing is very diverse. We have a segment of our show that we talk about a featured career in nursing. Uh, we've heard Dr. Pulfus talk earlier that uh, diabetes, she mentioned it as a comorbidity or that it is another part of uh, an illness that comes along with childhood obesity. So we've asked Suzanne Williamson, who's a nurse and a diabetes educator. Welcome to Nurses Talk, Suzanne. Thank you, Lisa. So what does it mean to be a diabetic educator? What does that title entail? 
Well, from a marketing standpoint, I can be honest that it, it really entails um, a very profitable um, educator position right now. And what I mean by that is as a diabetes educator, I'm in demand. I'm in demand in all different types of healthcare settings. I'm in demand in the acute care setting, which has an outpatient diabetic education department. I'm in demand in the school system. For example, in um, a K through eight uh, school where I can get in there early on and I can talk about prevention and good nutrition to prevent diabetes. I'm in demand in private sector settings. For example, I work a little bit in a gym and it's a perfect setting for a diabetic educator as well as a nurse because we already have that equipment there, that piece mm -hmm. for um, the fitness piece. So I'm in demand there. The other area is in the work site. Um, there are many employers that are implementing work site wellness programs right now to kind of control health care costs for their employees. And so um, additional training above certification for a diabetes educator might be um, work site wellness coordination. So that's another avenue where employers love to have a nurse come in there. The specialty is in diabetes education because half their employees have diabetes. But is it something that's learned on the job or is it a special um, internship? Yeah, or for you as a nurse. I mean, specialty? how did you get there? Right. The National Certification for Diabetes Educators is our governing body, and they have certain requirements for initial certification. There are many disciplines that can go for the certification, including pharmacists and dietitians. Oh, okay. um, but for me, as a registered nurse, you, you need to be in practice at least two years. The next step is that you have to have 1,000 hours of diabetic-related educational experience. That means you have to be working directly with the patient population, okay. doing something called diabetes self-management education, or DSME. And 40% or 400 of those hours have to be in that year preceding the application period. So the, the center, the certification body, wants that nurse to be entrenched right. in diabetes education. So you really know what you're talking so about. So you know what you're talking about before you can go for certification. The third piece is that you need 15 clock hours of diabetic-related education with, you, with your patients, plus the application fee. Mm -hmm. So that's what's needed for certification. So it's the kind of role that a nurse who, who really has a penchant for enjoying teaching and enjoying educating teaching is a and, great role. Right, and specific to diabetes education. The board is very particular. In fact, they want you to be entrenched. And they define that as that you work for an employer and your compensation is based on that. That is your main That's role your as job. a registered nurse. That is right, your job right. that it's you will teach job, right. diabetes self-management education not to just a floor nurse the population. Who's doing this no, in fact, if I were uh, if a med surge nurse wanted to go and get um, diabetic certification, she couldn't because she's working with all other disease processes okay. besides diabetes on the so they really surgical protect, floor. I mean, that's, you know, a very protected certification. You know, they're right. keeping it very keeping sound. Keeping yourself and, authentic. Yep, yep right. right. Authentic. That's a great word. Absolutely. So what are some of the, I mean, now, so this is what you're doing, sadly. Yeah. You're, sadly. Great, great for you, sadly, for the state America. of diabetes in America that you're in so in demand. Mm -hmm. So what are uh, some of the big challenges that you're facing? Well, in, in the outpatient setting, and I'll go back and forth from private sector to outpatient setting, because in the outpatient setting, the client that comes in has an order by his physician or her physician that says, you, need, you have diabetes now. You need to go see the diabetic nurse educator. You need to, you need to, you need to. So they come in, they make an appointment, and they're in there, and, and you know, here I am. Right. And, you know, what stage are they in? Are they in denial? Uh, they, do they even know what type 2 diabetes is? So we have to work under a medical model. They might come in with a prescription to start on insulin. Well, guess what? Mrs. Smith doesn't want to start on insulin right now because she's in denial that she has type 2 diabetes. But the doctor says, your blood sugars are so high, you need to go on this, that, and the other thing, and you don't need to go see the nurse. Right. So they get in by us, and it's forced. That's the best way I can say that is it's more forced. And sometimes it works for that individual who's ready to, to change and to learn. And other times it's, are Let's you start serious? With the basics, right? Let's start with the basics. In the private sector, like in the gym environment, um, where it's more pay for service, they, they make an appointment to see you, similar to how a personal trainer might make an appointment because they want to change your body composition. So this individual at this point, in, in this environment says, you know, I'd like to come and see you. I want to learn more about my diabetes. I want to control it. I want to lose weight, eat better. That's, that's perfect mm -hmm. because they come with that open mind. They're ready to make those changes. 
And what are the signs that somebody might have type 2 diabetes starting? Whether it's type 1 or type 2, um, most frequently they'll come in with, you know, they're, they're going to the bathroom a lot. They're thirsty. Mm -hmm. They might have a little vision problems. They're tired all the time. And you go, well, okay, that's my life. I work five jobs. You know, I'm, go I'm 40, so I'm needing some glasses. I drink a lot of water, so I pee all day. So what I'm saying is the average person with type 2 diabetes has it for seven years, and, and they don't oh, know that they Lord. have it. And the damage is done on the, the body, The damage right? is starting damage to occur starting. on the cardiovascular yeah. system, the, the blood vessels. And it's interesting because when you look at childhood obesity, Prior to 1992, around 1994, only 2% of the pediatric population had type 2 diabetes. Well, from 1992 to 2005, we've, we've seen this obesity epidemic because we're encouraging and our school system's encouraging to follow that food guide pyramid. Well, now we're looking at 45% um, of children being obese and having so what's type wrong 2 with the diabetes. Pyramid? The pyramid, the old pyramid was had too many carbs. It didn't emphasize enough fruits and vegetables. So then we moved to this really complex food guide pyramid in 2005 called mypyramid.gov, which meant it was interactive. It wasn't just that picture anymore that you okay. seen posted at schools. Mm -hmm. So that's a resource for our patients. And before we go, we, we could go down this path for a long time. Yeah. And, I, and I don't mean to... I mean, clearly, you have been immersed in this as the American Diabetes Association right. wants you to be immersed in this as a professional. Where, if someone is interested, if, if we have an RN who's paying attention, we have nurses who want to do this, what do they need to do? I mean, where should they go? Where can they go for some more information? Or to a patient. Become, or a patient. Or a patient that wants right. to get in contact. Well, within this is our career. You know, we're talking about, a, you know, a, 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 an amazingly diverse a role for a nurse on, right. as, as in demand as you are becoming, unfortunately. With, within a healthcare organization, a nurse colleague can go internally to the inpatient or the outpatient diabetic education program. There's almost always an avenue in larger healthcare organizations where you have the team, right. the nurse, the dietitian, the pharmacist. Um, outside of that, you know, you could go to... Um, a, a gym, for example. I mean, there are some nurses that are working in that sector, but but not a lot. Um, as a nurse, you could send them to, um, or uh, you know, if they're looking for resources for their patient, the um, the government website. So the American Diabetes Association, the Mer Di American Dietetic Association. Um, but I but, can imagine a lot it, of people don't even know that somebody like this exists no, as a resource. But if I'm just a, a nurse without that certification, I. I guess I would look to um, my primary care provider, that patient's primary care provider. There's always a diabetic education department somewhere, whether it's inpatient or outpatient. That's great. Great. Wow. Wow. Like, yeah. uh, that's awesome, Sue. Thank you so much for joining us on Nurses Talk. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. And before we leave today, we're going to hear a few words from the kids at the daycare center. The sweets are really good, but they're not good for you. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, and we'll see you again on Nurses Talk. Bye now.